approach. It's completely by measuring the crop structure and bring it back in into the minimum that we hope corresponds to the correct crystal structure. And then as Carmel uh, said earlier on, the structure completion stage of finishing everything off. So we're making this assumption that our direct method solution is in the vicinity of the global minimum and that this refinement process, which is driven by the square, will bring us down into the lowest point of that minimum. Now what happens when the solution is not in the right area? Well, we're going to converge to a local minimum which is not the correct crystal structure and that is of really no value to us. So why do we need global optimization methods? We've heard that the power of direct methods is extraordinarily powerful and amazing that they continue to develop and new techniques, new insights come along. And they have been adapted very well, as we will hear in subsequent presentations, to the vagaries, shall we say, of power diffraction data. This is actually a very nice uh, microorganic uh, collective on just a laboratory, uh, a laboratory uh, diffractometer. And you'll see that there are lots of reflections as we move up to higher and higher angle corresponding to higher and higher resolution. Those reflections begin to overlap to a point where for any given intensity there's actually an awful lot of reflections contributing. And so we have a real problem in powder diffraction, and it doesn't matter how clever we are experimentally, what tricks and techniques we apply, and what high resolution instruments we bring to bear on the powder, we still end up with heavily overlapped reflections. And that gives us a problem of estimating those reflection intensities accurately, which really is a prerequisite for most techniques to start off in a structure determination. And following up on, on what Lucas was saying, we have generally a fairly short cutoff. This would correspond to about one and a half angstroms uh, resolution here. So we're quite limited due to form factor fall off in the extent to which we can collect high resolution data. For a typical case, of course, there are plenty of uh, organic materials that kick much further out in, uh, in two theta than this. But I'd say that's fairly typical. Just following up on the overlap problem, because it is key, if we have a well-resolved set of peaks, we have no trouble estimating the intensity of the first peak and the intensity of the second. If these peaks are accidentally overlapping, for example here, we still don't have any great problem estimating because we're modeling the peak shape and we'll get back out of that a reasonable approximation of IA and IB. Not as accurately as we get here, because there will be a degree of correlation between the intensities, but nevertheless, very good for most purposes. Where we run into real trouble is where the reflections are sitting so close together that the correlation between their intensities is so high that for any given reflection, we actually have a relatively low degree of confidence in the intensity estimate that we get as a result of profile fitting. And you can illustrate this in an, in an extreme case. We have data, an observed peak, with two contributing reflections. Of course, our data is subject to error, so an error bar there. And when you come to do the polyfit, which is basically a, a model-free fit to the data, to fit the profile and estimate the reflection intensities, you find that there's no reason why this solution, where we have two basically equipartition intensities, or this solution where they're split roughly 75-25, or even this solution where we have a very strong peak correlated with a peak with negative intensity, there's absolutely no reason why those can't fit to within experimental error. And you find that when you do the poly fit, very often you will get areas such as this where we have a strong positive correlated with a strong negative. However, if you do the fit correctly and you preserve the correlation matrix that comes out of the least squares fit, then it really doesn't matter what the individual intensities uh, are because it will always sum back up to give us the net intensity of the observation. 
And from a global optimization perspective, what we're going to do differently from direct methods and from what Lucas has just described is we're actually going to use the chemical information in a very active form. We have an information deficit in our powder diffraction pattern. We're going to try and convert it top to top by inputting as much information as we can about the structure that the chemist has told us they have made. So we can guess what the structure is. Several speakers have said that, certainly within the powder sessions uh, thus far. So we collect some data. We hopefully know what the unit cell is, if we can index it, we can determine the space group. There are very efficient programs now to take the hard work and the guesswork out of space group uh, selection. We know, I say the molecular formula, we know the molecular formula that the chemist has provided. So we can guess the structure, we just paste all these bits of information together and we can calculate some structure factors, we can reconstruct a pattern. And that pattern can be compared directly with our observed pattern. So you see that the requirement to know the individual reflection intensities in our pattern is completely obliterated. We simply need to know how everything sums up to reconstruct our calculated pattern and then do a comparison with what we have observed. So let's talk about uh, a calculated pattern and an observed pattern. Like I said, this is my observed data that's collected on a different tometer, and this is my initial guess from a completely random model, because bearing in mind that we, we know the unit cell of the space group, but we know nothing a priori about where the molecule is, or how it's folded, or in which direction it's pointing. So the chances of our initial guess being correct are zero. Actually, no, technically they're finite, but let's, let's say, uh, since we're in a meeting where probabilities uh, rule, let's say that the probability of our guess being correct is effectively zero. And so we're going to have to do lots and lots and lots of guesses to try and get a better agreement. And so whatever agreement factor you choose to use to compare your observed and your calculated better be a fast one. And so we use something called a correlated integrated intensities figure of merit, where we do a one-off extraction of intensities from a powder pattern, and then all the calculations are done on those set of intensities. We don't refer back to the powder pattern except very periodically, just to update the user and the fit. But of course, there's no reason why you can't use the traditional Bell RWP where the full profile is carried uh, or compared. But you have to write it in such a form that it is done very, very fast, because as you will see, we need lots of evaluations. And critically, this agreement space, whether it's an RWP or chi-squared, is a function of the parameters that control our model. In other words, where our molecule is, which way it's pointing, and how it's folded. So we have a function that uh, has n parameters, and the agreement surface, I mean this is just a completely arbitrary one, is going to have some bearing like this, except that it's going to be an n dimension, so we can guess that it's going to be reasonably complicated. Going back again, referring back to, to look at the end size, really the, the topology of the, the spaces, the intersections of the spaces, was really important. And shape is everything in this agreement surface. So if it were, for example, everywhere convex, it wouldn't matter where we started from. We would always go to the same minimum. So here's a one-dimensional, and there's a two-dimensional. It doesn't matter where I guess on X. On these two uh, parameters here, I will always converge to the same point here. But in general, this is a situation that we're in where our starting point becomes important. If we pick a random structure, remember I just said a second ago, we don't know where the molecule is and really how it's folded. If we land in this space here and do a local minimization, we will stop here. We'll have no idea that just over this hill is in fact the global minimum. And the same is true of starting from anywhere here. So this is why we need to do the global optimization to find this global minimum. So can we get some sort of uh, insights into 
the shape of the surface uh, any sort of feel for the number of minima. And if you look in the structure determination for how the fraction data book fills, done some really uh, simple but elegant calculations that give you some idea of the widths of, uh, of minima within these surfaces. But we recently did a few uh, like brute force calculations that, that show up and reinforce what Bell found very clearly. And so what I'm going to do is actually solve this structure here, which is thermotidine, it's an anti ulcer drug, which you can see plenty of degrees of freedom in there, many ways that it can fold. And I'm going to solve it many times, in fact a million times, and I'm going to record the stationary point values and have a look at how they're distributed. And this is the result that we get back. The answer actually lies, sorry for the, the offset, no, no idea why it's chosen to, uh, to do that, but uh, the bottom line is that the solution where the chi-squared is actually down about 80 or so is found a small number of times, but you can see that there are a vast number of minima or more technically stationary points on the surface where the local minimizer is stopping and saying, I'm happy. If you tally them all up, it turns out there's about a quarter of a million minima on this relatively a simple problem, and somehow our optimizer has to weave its way through these and explore the space in order to get to the solution which is down at this end. So here's a very, very simple flowchart, been reproduced many times in many different forums and many different papers, that shows the loop that we run through in global optimization. So we start with the assumption that we have the unit cell in the space group. We construct a trial model along the lines I've just described, we calculate the diffraction data, compare it with the observed data to give it some sort of cost function. We ask the question, have we reached a value that we're happy with, that we would say that the structure has been solved? If yes, excellent, get to publishing, we have our solution. If no, then we invoke some sort of search method to update the variables to control the position and the orientation uh, and the confirmation of the molecules within our box and we go around the loop again. And in general we're going to end up going around this loop hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of times, depending on problem complexity. So, we've been leading up to really uh, outlining the problem here and I won't reiterate that. The big question is how do we negotiate this space that we're, uh, that we're stuck in. Now there's an incredibly simple approach to this. Imagine that this is a, a section of a, of a very simple two-dimensional problem, let's say an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, and we're looking at a cost function here, and this is the lowest point uh, on our cost function surface. A very, very simple way to do that is just to systematically sample the space in a regular fashion, just build up a grid of points. So basically we guess the solution here and then we increment x and move along and then we increment up y and do exactly the same. And obviously you can control the fineness of the grid. Big steps, for example, here up this axis is probably not a very good idea, so we should really have more rows here. And if we do the grid fine enough, we're absolutely guaranteed that we're going to find the minimum. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that it's not a particularly efficient method. And particularly when you move up to higher dimensions, the grid just becomes verging on the unmanageable. And so it's slow, it's not really attractive for problems that have a high number of parameters, a high number of degrees of freedom. That said, if it's implemented properly, it can actually uh, work. And uh, for example, Vladimir Chernyshev has solved a good number of structures using a grid-based method that is certainly more sophisticated than this one. So we can't dismiss it entirely. Simulated annealing is a, is a fantastic uh, optimizer, and so I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about it. So here's our function that we're going to try and uh, move around. We propose a trial structure and we calculate a figure of merit, we have a chi squared or an RWP. We adjust some parameter, let's say that it's just the position of the molecule. And then we reevaluate 
the figure of merit. And we ask the question, has the figure of merit gone down? In other words, are we moving downhill? If so, great, we'll accept that move. Because we want to go downhill. If, on the other hand, recognising that going downhill only will only take us to a local minimum, if we get the case where we're actually moving uphill, the new configuration has a higher figure of merit uh, than, than the initial one, then we ask the question, do we accept that? We don't automatically reject it just because we move uphill. We in fact calculate a probability of acceptance just based on simple uh, metropolis criterion. And that becomes clear of a very simple example here. Imagine that we're on some point on a surface with some figure of merit of 50. If we move up from in a trial from this configuration to one up here, then the probability of accepting that is e to the 50 minus 100 divided by this figure here, which is a notional temperature of the system, and that gives us a probability of 0.6. <coughs> How do we use that? We then roll the dice. We, uh, I'm glad that I picked a different dice picture from Chris. That's nice, otherwise he would have accused me of plagiarism. We roll this random number generator, and if this number here is smaller than the number that we roll randomly between 0 and 1, then we accept the move. If it's not, we reject the move. But you can see that if I change this control parameter, the temperature, from 100 down to 10, the probability of acceptance goes down vastly. So the chances of this being accepted are now much less. So the key thing is, and this is where the, the analogy with annealing comes in, you're all familiar with the concept of annealing, you heat something up and you allow it to cool slowly and allow it to order. Well, we have a notional temperature in simulated annealing. When we have the temperature high, very large moves from, say, from here up to here are permitted. As we move on, we cool the system down and it becomes increasingly unlikely that these large jumps are going to be accepted. So downhill moves, always accepted, uphill moves, sometimes accepted, and the probability of uphill moves goes down with time. So it mimics annealing, and it will hopefully locate the global minimum. In fact, it's guaranteed to find it in an infinite time frame, but uh, most of us don't have that amount of time to wait. So what typically happens is we recognize we can only do a finite number moves and we do a simulated annealing run and if it converges and finds a global minimum that's fantastic if it doesn't well we do another one starting from a different random position and each run just goes off and explores space in a different way and that way the chances of finding the global minimum are raised. Then the area of powder refraction has been incredibly uh, successful so Yuri Andreev who's in the, in the audience Yuri wrote some simulated annealing code, applied it to battery type polymeric materials many years ago. Peter Stevens' code, Endeavour, our own code, Dash, the commercial powder solve, Plavides, Esquire, and many others. So I'm not going to bore you by showing you lots and lots of, of structures. I'll just show you that this idea that we subdivide this potentially infinite run into a series of much shorter runs. So this is actually 80 runs uh, in solving the structure that showed earlier on uh, from Otterdeen. And you'll see that we always start off from some random start point where the chi-squared value is high. Each of these lines represents the lowest point on the chi-squared surface that is encountered in simulated annealing cells. So if we could track one of those lines, we'd find that it headed off, you'll see sometimes, Spends quite a long period of time doing nothing and then drops down, corresponding to the answer. We'll see that a few solutions actually get stuck in a local minimum. So as I said, it's not perfect, but the bulk of the runs find the answer. Some of them find them close to the end of the run, some of them plummet down. It's, it's a random, it's a stochastic process is the way it's set that. Why is it so successful? Well, one is it's actually it's a very powerful algorithm, so we'll get that out of the way. Why has it been so successful in the context of powder diffraction? Well, 
we have a good stopping criteria. We know when we're getting close to the answer because we will have an RWP value, a fit value for this independent polyfit, model independent polyfit that I mentioned. And so if the simulated annealing RWP is very close to that, some small multiple, say three or four, of the best value that we could hope for, then we pretty much know that we have the answer. The algorithm, as you've seen, is easy to understand and it's very easy to control. We can determine temperatures automatically, uh, details such as, as these, I will, we will talk about it in our, in our demonstration tomorrow. It's almost infinitely modifiable as well, there are variants such as parallel tempering. And it's very easy to parallelize. Each of the individual simulated annealing runs can be executed in parallel rather than in sequence. They have no dependence on one another except in the case of parallel tempering. And of course there is code available for people using codes, which is great. But it's not the only kid on the block in terms of, uh, of solving the structures. Here's a, a tree, again shamelessly uh, lifted from, from the web, categorizing search techniques into enumerative ones, such as the, the grid search that we saw earlier, calculus-based ones that use gradient information, and then guided random search, which we've just talked about simulated annealing, and then this classification of evolutionary algorithms with a subtree of genetic algorithms and various uh, variants uh, there. And I'm going to say a little bit about the, the genetic mm -hmm. algorithms because it's probably the other technique that's, that's been used. It's certainly the one we explored initially uh, back in about 1997. And it's, well, it's about sex, and that's very sexy, and that's why people like it. So I think that's always uh, a good reason to talk about it even briefly. So we have a problem space I've, I've just defined. We're going to have an encoding technique and we're going to move into biological descriptors such as genes and chromosomes. We're going to create a population. We're going to have some sort of function evaluation. We're going to select parent molecules to breed and reproduce. We're going to do something to their children. We're going to throw some of them away rather ruthlessly. We're going to keep other ones. And we're going to control that with a whole raft of parameters. Not the use of the word art, we shall come back to that in a minute. So here's a, a real value, in, in their purest form, genetic algorithms are actually designed to work with zeros, zeros and ones in states, but they're relatively easy to adapt uh, to real value problems. So here's a molecule that's characterized, we'll just say, by some position, x, y, and z, and one torsion angle controlling this twist here. And so we have a mummy molecule with some random x, y, and z in the top, and a daddy molecule with a different x, y, and z in the top. They get together and produce a couple of kids, and you will see that they have swapped some information. This top has gone to here, this top has gone over here. And then kid B gets zapped by lightning, and its y coordinate is mutated to some completely different value. And so you can evaluate the function. Uh, of that, their fitness, so which is nothing more than their chi squared or their LWP, create a whole population and watch that population evolve with time. And ideally, you should end up with a kid who fits the data. It's, it's incredibly seductive, and in our experience, actually, I have to be honest, a bit of a dead end. It worked. But it was very, very tricky to control. There are a lot of potential parameters in a genetic algorithm. How big is your population? How often do you cross over and get parents to get together and produce children? How do you cull the population? How often do you mutate? An awful lot of pro uh, parameters, but there are programs available. So Ken Harris pursued this uh, pretty vigorously. Uh, Nishibori in Japan has recently released a program based on a lot of the ideas that Ken has published. And there's another program out of China called Guess that you can go and check out. But there's not really been sufficient momentum behind there to challenge, I think, the dominance of simulated annealing. Why not? Well, probably the lack of code, although that's starting to change. And it's certainly not straightforward or as automatic as simulated annealing, although it can be made that way. And there are variants, such as differential evolution, in which crossover and mutation are condensed out into a single operation. 
that work really quite efficiently. No code available, some example structures in the literature. Fairly recently, someone published uh, in JApple Chris a program called PetChrist, which actually implements another social algorithm called Particle Swarm, which is based really on the behavior of, uh, for example, a flock of birds flying around. If you watch birds in the way that they flock, there's clearly something quite complex going on. There's a leader that follows. It's, it's too much, too difficult to go into to explain. If you're interested, you can look it up. And so there is a program that implements that type of algorithm. But there are also deterministic examples. And so what I'm going to talk about briefly is some work really that was initialized by John Johnson and then pursued uh, by Bill and Anders Marquardt. And, and I was lucky enough to get involved in, in testing its efficiency. And it's a method called Hybrid Monte Carlo, which actually combines the best features of Monte Carlo and then these simulations. And probably the easiest way to imagine it is that if you're uh, your candidate solution is a hypothetical particle on the chi squared of the RWP surface. And we're actually going to give that particle a flick and start it rolling over that surface in a molecular dynamics style and let it explore the surface using gradient information to guide it. And this is what you get. This is just a, a single trajectory in a structure determination from powder. So I need to spend a little bit explaining what we're, what we're seeing here. We have a notional potential energy, which is just a chi-square, how well we're fitting our data. And on the top, you'll see this graph of total energy, which is the sum of the potential plus whatever initial energy we gave it when we flipped it and set off rolling over the surface. So in a single MD trajectory, you'll see that the particle negotiates minima very effectively. So it's sampling space as it moves over. It ends up at a chi-square lower than it, than it started. But along the top, you will see that the total energy has taken some rather odd excursions. And that's because this hypothetical particle is attempting to follow the surface, which is really quite sharp. Errors start to accumulate, and you, the particle begins to move away from the surface. So at the end of a single trajectory, you apply a Monte Carlo except reject step. If you're happy to accept it, then your trajectory continues from that point. If you reject, you move back to the beginning and flick again, this time in a different direction. So conceptually, it's quite straightforward. It's far from straightforward to implement, but very, very powerful. We, we compared it in a, in a paper with Giambo Chris many years ago, now to the simulated annealing, um, and found it was substantially more efficient. This is crystal structure in the whole component of chili peppers, uh, and we could solve that substantially faster with HMC than we could uh, with simulating annealing, but we've still got to get around to coding up uh, properly. So maybe when we retire, we shall do that. The potential there is, is very high and something really that we should pursue. How are we doing for time, Bill? Right. Uh, I'm going to be in uh, two minutes. You have seven minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, back to local minimization, having trashed it earlier on as an approach, I'm now going to say actually maybe there is a role. And here's a, a local minimizer uh, called the Simplex that some of you may well be uh, familiar with. And it can be used, uh, I won't go into the detail just because of time constraints here, but there are elements that are very similar to the, the overprojection concept that, that Lucas mentioned. Imagine that you have this surface that you wish to negotiate. You guess three points forming a simplex. You reflect the highest point on the surface through the centroid of this line here to give you a new point on the surface. If it's going downhill, you say, oh, this is good. And so you push your lock and you actually over project by the same amount. And if you continue to go down, you pursue that. If in fact you find that this reflection takes you uphill, you can actually come back in and propose a new point. And what you find is that rather like an amoeba, this triangle crawls over the surface and takes you down quite quickly to the local minimum, which is somewhere over here. And there's some lovely little Java applets on the web that let you do this on, on test functions. 
And for many years, uh, we've employed the simplex at the end of simulated nailing in Dash. Simulated nailing is great at finding the local minimum. Uh, sorry, the global minimum. It's not so hot at pulling you down to the very, very bottom of that global minimum. So at the end, we always employ a simplex to pull this down quickly. It converges much faster. So, that ah, technology. So when this button is ticked here, it invokes the simplex uh, minimizer at the end. Even simpler than the simplex, and, and one that you should all be familiar with, and if you're not, then you can do as Chris recommended this morning and just go off and get yourself a copy of your medical recipes. Basically, these two minimizer algorithms, quasi Newton or conjugate gradient, occupy roughly one side of, uh, of a page in Fortran code. Very, very straightforward things, but quick, efficient, robust local minimizers, but they will only go to the closest local minimum, or more technically, the closest stationary point. What's interesting about them is that we, we just did this almost for fun, just to see what would happen. We went back and we took, again, this commodity uh, example, although it works for even more complicated examples, such as the Kipsason. And we simply said, we wrote a program that said, take a structure, throw it randomly into the cell, and minimize, and let's see what we get. And in fact, you saw the distribution of minima earlier on in the table. What really, I think, took us aback was the fact that some of the solutions by local minimization went all the way down the playground slide from this massive chi-squared, no surprise because we're just throwing in a random structure, and it goes using only downhill steps, never uphill, down, 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 and by this point, the crystal structure is solved. The most interesting thing really, for me, is that I, I guess in many ways we get lured into it because we're, we're used to solving structures and then we're finding them. We expect that something that sits in the basin of the local minimum has to make chemical sense, but that's clearly not the case. That does not make chemical sense. But in the topology of the surface that we're exploring, there is a route which involves only downhill moves that takes us from this garbage in to structure out. So yet another violation of the, of the bill. <laughs> now, just to emphasize, these are all points in the trajectory, not just the best ones. So it is only going genuinely downhill. <coughs> and of course, nothing's perfect. All the start points are truly random. That's we, we, we accept that. Not all runs succeed, and in fact, not many runs succeed. But of those that do, they solve in 50 microseconds, which is pretty fast. And that's just on a desktop TV, PC, we're not talking supercomputers here. And because it's easy to parallelize, it means we can set off lots and lots of jobs independently and just watch them and pick out the ones that make it down that child slide to the end. So it's still very early days, and as Carmel uh, emphasized earlier on, we need to demonstrate it with more, more problems, but we're hopeful that it's, it might provide at least a competitive approach to, to pure standard global optimization methods. Okay. Perfect. Okay, I just want to emphasize that many of these global optimization methods are stochastic, they involve random numbers, random start points, and so if you're going to publish something that says uh, some particular change of a parameter is important, or the formulation of the molecular model is important, then make sure that you do a decent sampling. Simply doing one run with condition A and one run with condition B and saying that B is better than A is not sufficient. This distribution here shows the sort of spread within a fixed set of parameters, so how can you possibly compare contrasting parameters unless you do lots and lots of runs? And we found that parallel computing can certainly help this regard. Just literally a couple of days ago I did a quick check to see if there was anything new and I came across uh, this new method called EPCRIS, again coming out of a group in China, so I'll just leave you 
uh, to read that. If you want to, to find out more about it, then uh, go off and, and read up on it, the, the papers of J.R.O. Chris. But basically, they're taking some trial starting models and applying a set of selectors to them, being you know, energetically or confirmationally, before moving into the global optimization stage. This is something that other people have done. I've yet to go and look at the paper and see how well this is working. I believe it was uh, been demonstrated largely with inorganic materials. Okay, okay, I won't reiterate anything of this uh, other than to say we are unlikely to run out of global optimization methods. I've only mentioned a few. There are hundreds of thousands of different ones. I think we're more likely to run out of imaginative names for our powder solution programs than we are to run out of methods. Chris mentioned powder data, the website where you can actually download data for testing uh, your algorithms or just simply for practicing. It is still alive and kicking. Unfortunately, someone who wasn't me forgot to renew the domain name that it got stolen from us. Uh, but once I have that, I will, I'll find that out and put it up later on in the session. So all that remains for me to do is to thank you all very much for your attention.
Ahmed Chukunda University, Shabbat. Uh, thank you so much for talking. Just my question about uh, what about using block level mechanics and calculations? Uh, Sorry, I, I, you're all a bit too coarse, I can't. Uh, my question about uh, what about using block level mechanics calculations uh, to obtain uh, uh, global optimization instead of uh, molecular dynamics? It is possible? I don't know. Molecular mechanics. mechanics. Oh, molecular no, mechanics? No. No, no, no. no. No, the, the MD is the most efficient way of exploring the, the phase space um, because it's using gradient information. You could, I mean, if you wanted to use molecular mechanics in advance, perhaps to optimize a model, but no, molecular dynamics is definitely the way to do it in, in a situation such as that. Yeah, I mean, just be putting it in the cost function effectively. Yeah, <laughs> and pe people have done it. They have calculated energies along the way. And for all I know, this uh, EP Chris. This new paper may do something similar, pre-scanning on the basis of quick micromechanics. The trouble with, with introducing things such as micromechanics is you automatically introduce parameterizations that, and approximations that may not suit the particular system that you're working on. No more questions? Yep. How does this method react on data missing in a particular direction? I mean, we've done a limited amount of experience on that, on incomplete single crystal data sets, so for example, with something that Colin Poe uh, spoke about yesterday in the powder session, data sets collected at a high pressure, where you only have access to a small volume of reciprocal space, and in fact they work extremely well, simply because you're supplying so much chemical information in advance. In some of the cases that Colin described, he knows exactly what you put in. And so he has a very accurate molecular model. And so you simply optimize against the data that you have. So okay. Try to be very patient. Uh, I just, on the, on the formatting case, I just missed, it seemed to me that the first, the first example on the top uh, had a different co confirmation, the molecular confirmation was different from the other two. And I wonder how, how you took that into account. So, so I just want to skip it's, it's about four or five back. Um, sorry, off. So this, yeah, here, right. This chart here. Yeah, the, the top one looks like it's got a completely different kind. It, it, it does indeed. It's totally and utterly random. So each point is a different random confirmation as well so, as a different. Okay, so what we do is we, we assign random values for the position and the orientation and for all the torsion angles. So it can form up into any form. And then the unfolding is only a reflection of the fact that it's moving downhill. So what we've done is at each, as, as we move downhill, we just simply track the structure. And, and it's really just to illustrate, it really doesn't matter what it's doing in between. I think the key thing that I was wanting to get across was this idea that somehow perhaps we had guessed a lucky start point that was basically close to the true structure, and that is not the case. We guessed a rubbish one, but it goes straight to the true structure. Well, I see somebody in the front row to ask a question. That's yeah. fine. I want to, to continue on Mattel's question. So you won't, you won't be able to see, uh, I mean, to find unexpected reactions. Uh, will you? And do you? There is a. I mean, there is a certain possibility to get a very good solution of something that is not uh, the the right. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have examples of this? Oh, we've got we've we've got quite a few uh, examples of things. And I'll give you a very simplistic one, and that is in the case of a, a structure which is, for example, an SO two NH two group. The, the scattering power of NH2 is roughly on a par with that of the, the two oxygens, so you can have three possible configurations, bad, bad, or bad. The resolution of the data we're using to solve is insufficient to tell us bad, but we're chemists. We don't all chemical pharmacists, but we're sort of chemists. <laughs> uh, so even I will recognize in the output structure the fact that I'm not certain that the one that it's settled on needs to be correct, but I'll look at the hydrogen bonding. If the hydrogen bonding isn't satisfied, I'll flip it round if it is. I'm a happy chappy. But my resolution of state, it doesn't mean that. 
Oh, high, high resolution, it, it does pick up. And, and one of the things we want to do with this minimization method is explore, someone mentioned earlier on, the, the, the impact on structure determination of the type of data that you use. Did you just use low resolution? Did you use high? It's something that remains to be explored. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm sure there are wrong structures. Oh, so I, I, again, yes. one, I, I, I would disagree. None, none that we've published, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have it's your fault. Uh, yeah, almost at the point. Right now, I say I'm going to get a few tours like this. Yeah. All right. Do we have any, uh, do you know any applications for evidence or uh, comparing the effectiveness of simulated and enabled in genetic algorithms? Because of GA looks uh, so well suited to this task for proteins and both proteins and power delivery. Uh, multiple solutions and uh, given your choice to select a uh, physically correct solution. Do you know any implications really proving that SA is better for this program? The, that, that, that's, a, that's a topic of a week long conference uh, in itself. In the specific area of powder refraction, no, there's no head to head between the two, and I don't think you could unless you applied any sort of, you know, for example, a global constraint such as solution time, do a direct comparison. However, in the field of, for example, electronics and computer science, there is an enormous body of literature directly comparing and contrasting SA and GA. The problem with GA is that there are so many different variants of it. And we once, in, in the IUCR in 1999, no, was it? Yeah, it was. We invited a proper statistician along to talk about genetic algorithms and he made a very telling comment and he said that the reason genetic algorithms work so well is because people invest so much time and effort in making them work well. They can soak up a tremendous amount of problem specific information and so a direct comparison I, I think is a very very hard thing to do. One last uh, rather than yeah, just, just to provide one for the question, there have been a rounding or structural solution from all the interaction map and the line. Yes, that's how many people are like this or how many of the interaction we have. Yes, that, that's true. Rather than just point out that there's a yeah. there several tests put out to the powder diffraction community uh, to say, here's some data, can you solve it? And so people will tackle it by direct methods or by simulated or by GAs. Um, so they, they, they might give you some degree of effectiveness. I'm not sure they give you a, a really good comparison, again, because of the implementation differences I mentioned. But simply, it's a good indicator. Look here, that's what it's Thank you very much again, Ken. I want to uh, make a couple of announcements.